check, check on this. Check, check. Good to see everyone on this uh, nice morning today. We all know we were due. When you see it gets a little nasty outside and look who's missing. George over here. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, just kidding. <laughs> hey, George, if you're at home, thanks for missing out today. Okay, I got, a, I got more announcements than I normally, normally have, so bear with me here. A bunch in the bulletin there, and we also got our events board in the back, so we'll just run through those. <clears throat> Monday, we are not, I mean, not we, the ladies are not having ladies' night, so canceled for tomorrow due to the weather, I'm sure, so uh, no ladies' night tomorrow. I'm sure the ladies will pass that on to anybody they need to, so I won't do any more on that. <clears throat> Tuesday, Mary, I don't know, you want to touch on what you're doing a little there? Yeah, we'll uh, let Aaron know maybe Tuesday for the weather, if you, or maybe just let the ladies group, I don't know what you ladies have going on. But, yeah, get it passed around if you're going to cancel it anyway. <clears throat> Awana on Wednesday, and uh, today's Palm Sunday. Seems like it snuck up on us this year, but that also means we have some services coming up. Uh, Monday, Thursday, we'll have a communion service, 6 o'clock, if you can make it. And also, Friday, we'll have a Good Friday service at 6 also. So at, on Friday, we'll have a soup supper that will start at 6 and we'll, service will be after downstairs in the basement for that. So 6 o'clock Thursday and Friday, Monday, Thursday, and a Good Friday service. Uh, a couple more deals on the bottom there. You can read through those. Ladies retreat at uh, New Hope. You can, Nancy will fill you in if you need to on that. Also next week, no Sunday school. But we'll have breakfast at 9 instead. So you can still come at 9. We'll have breakfast, but no Sunday school next week. Okay, ladies, uh, Audrey will be sending out messages for what needs to be brought. So anything else I'm missing? Soup supper and breakfast. Sarah's in charge of the soup supper. Ladies, you'll be getting messages for both nights. Anybody else? We'll keep the menings in our prayer uh, with Kathleen. Also the Van Gorp and Lafer's family as they both lost... Uh, Lost loved ones this uh, last week and a half or so. Oh, they, uh, I see your hand up back there. Okay, thanks, Avea. Sarah says I'm deaf, so... Um, I'll blame it on that. I didn't hear you. I'll assume you talked loud enough. <clears throat> John. So, yeah, John's boys are heading back to down south today, so safe travels there. And also, Ashley's not feeling well, so we'll include her in our prayers of Aya's mother. Anyone else? We have Terry Vanenhook sitting there beside his brother Dwayne today, so thanks for bringing him along, everybody. that all? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for today, and uh, just want to praise you today and this week, Lord, as we enter the quote-unquote Holy Week. Uh, first of all, just today as you uh, rode on that donkey through Jerusalem and all your glory, and 
and uh, then as we move on through the week to the Last Supper, Good Friday, with your suffering and death there, Lord, and then next week as we celebrate your glorious resurrection on Easter, Lord, we just want to be mindful of that this week and also help us to proclaim that and to share that with those around us, Lord. And this morning, we have some uh, prayer concerns, Lord. Uh, first of all, just want to pray for the Van Gorps and the Lafers uh, as they lost a little boy and also uh, Troy there. Just be with the families and comfort them in their time of need, Lord. Help them to seek you and uh, just to uh, look to you for their need there, Lord. Also be with the Mennings as uh, Kathleen's been moved into hospice, Lord. Just give comfort to that family as well. And uh, as her time on earth is nearing an end, Lord, just... Uh, Help her to be a testimony to those around her and her family as well. Uh, she's a great gal and has a great love for you, Lord. Also this morning, we lift up uh, Ashley Harris. She's not feeling well. Uh, help her to get back into normal condition there, Lord, so she can uh, be up and active and, and uh, getting around there as well. Also today, pray for David and Johnny heading back down south. Just be with them as they're on the slick, icy, uh, snow-covered roads. Help them to arrive safely there as well, Lord. And uh, today, just be with our service. Just open our hearts to your words through the message, Lord. Help it to stick there that we can use it in our lives. And uh, most of all, Lord, just help us to uh, or just accept our praise and worship to you, Lord. And we are always thankful and forever thankful for what you have done, and we just remember that today and this week, Lord, especially, and we pray in your son Jesus' name, amen. Let's greet each other this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'd like to read um, out of Philippians 2 this morning. We'll focus our attention on who Jesus is. And I don't know, am I coming through? Can they turn it up now? Need a little bit more mic up here, please. Out of Philippians 2, verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the first two songs we're going to sing today are focusing on Jesus' name, the name of Jesus that is highly exalted. These are older songs. Um, just worship with them this morning and worship with me. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. 
you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my death to die, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. One more time. Lord, I lift your name on high. John 10. <clears throat> well, anyway, <clears throat> if I find it, where it talks about um, the, the sheep and the, the shepherd and his flock, and when Jesus says uh, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, you know, Jesus knows our name. He knows who we are, not only uh, before we're saved, but after we're saved. He calls, he calls us. And then in Revelation, it talks about he gives us a new name. So we'll talk about a little bit more about uh, who Jesus' name is, but also he knows our name. I have a man. Thank you. 
seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You were my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. every knee will bow. Lord, teach, teach us to bow our knee here and now, each day. We love you, Lord. Amen. Pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Precious Father, we do thank you for another day. We thank you for time and consent. Come here and spend time with you, Lord, and glorify you, Lord. We just uh, thank you for your many blessings each and every day and for coming alongside of us, Lord, and that we can lean on you, Lord. We just uh, thank you for, um, we think of Easter coming up, for the penalty you paid for our sins, Lord, that we could not pay and rose again defeating death on the third day, Lord. We just thank you for all the love there that you show us and the desire that you have for each and every one of us, Lord, if we but follow you. And we, too, we just ask that you uh, be with uh, the Van Gorp family and the Lafer family and Joyce family, Lord, that you all just comfort them, Lord. We just um, thank you for uh, being there for them and uh, that they can come to you and, and have the peace that uh, you can give them through uh, certain situations, Lord. We do pray for um, Ashley that you'll be with her and help her uh, get over her sickness, Lord. We just uh, thank you for all your healing power and we think of Kathleen as well, Lord, that you'll be with the Manning family and Kathleen and uh, we just thank you for her testimony and we just pray that you continue to be in her life uh, with the time she has here, Lord, and um, just knowing that you are with her and, and waiting for her to come home to you. And we just uh, pray now that you'll be with the uh, missionaries, uh, local and abroad, Lord, that you'll just empower them and, and um, that they can go and spread this time of Easter, your uh, commitment that you did make to us on the cross, Lord, and the love that you show us there, Lord. We, too, uh, just ask you to be with John and give him the words to say that can touch our hearts in a special way, and 
and um, that we can hunger for more of you, Lord, and be more like you, Lord. We just uh, thank you that for that as well, Jesus. We, too, just pray now as this offering that we can give with a joyful, thankful, and generous heart, Lord, and that we can uh, use it in a way to further your kingdom here on earth. And I pray this all in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. I think this is the right one. Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm going to sing Oceans by Hillsong. It's a song that um, I've turned to many, many times because it brings me comfort and peace, but also uh, confirmation from God when I'm, when I'm in prayer. So I'm going through a lot of trials and tribulations right now. So I figure what better way than to honor God and worship him. If you know the words and you want to sing along, please feel free to.
Yahweh, Yeshua. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your comfort, your protection, and everything that you bless us with. Make sure we're on here. There we go. Well, today's Palm Sunday. We're going to do something here. Uh, I'm going to we're going to watch a little video here in a second to kind of get us uh, get our minds going in the right direction. And we're going to do a little thin thing with the kids. Now I know this is a little last minute. All right, so I need everybody who is fifth grade and under to help me out with this. All right, I'm going to describe it a little bit now. Maybe remind you of it later. Okay, we're going to watch this video and then kind of get it in our heads. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to sing a song, uh, Hosanna, Praise is Rising, all right? And maybe some of you high schoolers in here, maybe you can help the kids with this too, all right? So basically, while I'm singing the song, I'm going to ask you guys to come forward during the song and grab these palm branches, okay? Bob, grab at least one, and if there's enough, two. And then you'll go back to the back, and while we're singing, so you're doing this while we're singing, and then you're going to go to the back, and you're going to walk down the aisle and just be waving them as we're singing. If we're still singing at that point in time, then just kind of... Just kind of line up here in the front and just kind of be waving them as we're singing the song. And then when we get done with the song, I'll have you put them back and then we'll sit down and I'll have a little children's message for you. We'll talk about Palm Sunday a little bit. So that's kind of what we're going to do here. But we're going to watch this video first uh, as, we, as we get ready for this. So let's go ahead and uh, let's, well, let me just make sure I got this on, huh? Okay. Go ahead and, yeah, hit go ahead and play. In a small corner of the city, a parade began. No internet. No announcements, no tweets. Word of mouth carried the news. And the parade had no floats, no balloons, no bands. Just the voices of the people singing one word. Hosanna. The word has no actual meaning. It'd be like trying to define the word hooray. But still, they knew what it meant. Hosanna, the king has arrived. Jesus had been working quietly behind the scenes, urging people to not tell of what they saw. But how can you keep a secret like that? They were ready for him. They had been praying for his arrival for generations. The Messiah had come. Hosanna. They waved branches. They threw their coats on the road. It was all they could do. They gave him a breeze and they sang him a song. Hosanna. It was all they had. They would die for him. But what they didn't understand is that it was going to happen the other way around. The Pharisees were watching, waiting, planning. He was too popular. The crowds would follow him anywhere. But even if you silence the crowd, you can't silence creation. Even if you silence the crowd, the rocks would sing, the trees would take up chorus, and the earth itself would sing, Hosanna. Hosanna, the king has arrived. Palm Sunday, the day Jesus rides in, rides in. All right, let's have everybody stand up. And again, kids, again, fifth grade and under, we're going to ask you to come and help with this. So as soon as we start singing, you guys come up, grab a palm, head to the back, all right? So, well, wow, we already got people moving. That's great. Then head to the back and just come back down the aisle. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. 
we turn to you. That hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Circle around again, Ryan. Circle around again. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. And then just stand up front. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. We turn to you in your kingdom and in your kingdom. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. With your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come every way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, cause when we see you, cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day, in your presence, in your presence, all our fears are washed away, again cause when we see you, Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Oh, in your presence, all our fears are washed away. The washed away, the washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come every way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. One more time, Hosanna, and Hosanna, wave them high, guys, wave them high, back and forth. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Yes, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. That's right. All right, you guys can be seated. Hey, kids, go ahead and put those palm fronds back in that vase there. Uh, when you guys leave today, if you want to take one with you, you're more than welcome to. Now come and take a seat on the stage here, right in front. The rest of you guys can sit down back there. All right. So here's my first question to you. Does anybody know what those are called? What are they called? Palm branch, right? I'm just warming you up, warming you up. Okay, palm branches. Now, what did you do with those palm branches? You waved them around. Very good. Why were you guys waving those palm branches around? What do you think? Why? Why? That's what they did when they were singing Hosanna, okay? They were waving the palm branches, okay, when they were singing Hosanna. Good. Well, do you know what Hosanna means? 
You don't. You don't. Do you know what Hosanna means? Do you know Regan? What does Hosanna mean? Huh? Animals. Okay, okay. <laughs> what does Hosanna mean? Do you know? Okay, like hooray, right? It's kind of hard to find. You heard it in the video. It's like hooray, okay? So they're singing Hosanna. And what, what though? Their Hosanna does have a significance to it of why they were singing Hosanna. What? That the Lord was coming. It, it was them praising God, okay? Now, you guys are waving those palm branches around and, you know, might have had, you know, maybe you had one, maybe you had two, okay? Do you know of anyone else that might wave something around, like at a basketball game? A baseball bat? You're going to wave around a baseball bat at a basketball game? Well, I'm not sure about that. Okay, you could wave around a flag, okay, which is very interesting. Maybe you wave around a flag at a game because you know what? Those palm branches, those were actually their national symbol. It really was like waving a flag. Very good. That was a subtle one, but you got that part. There's another one I'm going to apply though here in a second, okay? So that was like the Jewish people, the Israel's national symbol. So when they're waving those palm branches, it's like waving a flag. They're saying, hey, we are the nation of Israel, and we are waiting for our king to come. Now, why were they waiting for their king to come? Do you know why? What, what, do you know what the problem was? What was the problem? They were waiting for a long time. They were waiting a very long time for him to come. Now, do you, does anybody know who was in charge of the nation of Israel at the time? Does anybody know? Does anybody know who was in charge? Do you guys know who was in charge? No? Who? No. Well, okay, ultimately God is in charge of everything, yes. Yes, we lock at that. But there's a certain nation. Let me ask you. The Jewish nation, they weren't in charge of anything. Who was in charge? Rome was in charge, exactly. So the Romans were in charge of the Jewish nation. So the Jews were not free. The Jews were kind of in a way, not quite slaves, but, but they just didn't have their freedoms, and they had a lot of burdens put on them by the Romans. And so their cry for so long is, God set us free from all this. God set us free, okay? So did God send somebody to set them free? Yeah, God was sending someone. Who, who was God sending? God was sending Jesus. And who marched into Jerusalem then on that day? Did he march in? No, what did he do? He rode a donkey. Why did he ride a donkey in, do you know? You don't know? Why did he ride a donkey in, do you know? Do you not have to walk? Okay, yes, very good. So you don't have to walk. Good answer. But actually, no, that was not the right answer. <laughs> good try. Do you know why he rode on a donkey? Does anybody know? What? Oh, that would be a good guess because Mary rode on the donkey. People think Mary rode on the donkey. We don't know that for sure, but that is a really good guess. There might be a connection to the donkeys. Good, good. Okay, let me just give you one. I'm going to give you two real quickly. Okay, number one, it was prophesied about it in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Zacharias said that the coming Messiah was going to come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. So Jesus was fulfilling prophecy of the Old Testament. The second reason is everyone expected a victorious warrior to come riding in on a big stallion, a white stallion. But Jesus comes in on a donkey. You know why? Because he was coming in as a humble servant. He was going to come and serve his people. All right, one more application, and we'll be done with this. So another reason. So at a, at a, there's something, uh, there's some, sometimes at sporting events, there's a line of young ladies and young men who do things on the sideline, what are they called? Maybe no. Cheerleaders. And what do sometimes cheerleaders hold in their hands? Pom. Pom-poms. Interesting. Is it spelled the same as those? No, it's not spelled the same, but it sounds the same. Isn't that crazy? Pom-poms. All right? They're raising pom-poms. In a very similar way, though, not only were they raising it and waving it like a flag, but they were like cheering. It's like they were holding pom-poms like at a game or an athletic event. And they were saying, woo-hoo, victory, victory, victory's come. Woo-hoo. That's kind of what they were doing when they're shouting out Hosanna. Woo, we're going to win, we're going to win, woo Oh, I'm going to break this pew. <laughs> A little too excited there, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be kind of funny if I like fell over in the pew? That would be pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. so their, their victory, okay, it was a victory march of them coming in and saying, hey, our Savior's come, our warrior king has come, okay? So we're going to do something here. Here's what I need your help with, okay? We're going we're gonna to make a little acronym, okay? We're going to pretend like you're cheating. So you guys stand up, all right? All right? And what you're going to do, we're going to start this out, okay? 
You're going to say, give me a P, and then everybody out there has to say P, right? Remember how, we, you know how we've done this before, right? We're going to spell palms, P-A-L-M-S. We're going to do that to them. They're going to shout it back, and then we'll do the next part. Ready? So we, on the count of three, we're going to say, give me a P. They'll respond. Then we'll say, give me an A. Then they'll respond, and then we'll give it, right? Ready? Okay. All right, ready? One, two, three. Give me a P. P. Give me an A. A. Give me an L. L. Give me an M. L. Give me an S. S. What's that spell? Oh. What's that spell? Oh. What's that spell? Oh. Woo! Everybody wave your hands in the air like you just don't care. Yay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Go ahead and take a seat. You did a good job. Wait, I didn't say leave. I said take a seat. All right? Okay, final thing here. We're going to take, take the four letters, P-A-L-M, and I want you to come up with four things that we might thank God or praise God for. Okay? So letter P, what is something you might praise God for that starts with a P? Can you think of anything? Puppies. We got puppies we want to praise God for. Okay. How about a letter A? A letter A. Can you think of a letter A? What do you want to praise God for? Apples. Okay, we're going to praise God for puppies and apples. What else? L. Well, it might be an L word. You might want to praise God for something. Okay? Li- Ooh, that's a good one. Praise God for life. Absolutely. So we got puppies, we got apples, and we got life. Okay? Letter M. Maybe think of a letter M to praise God with. Okay? Well, let me see if anybody else has one. You gave me one already. Well, you gave me one already, too. Let me see if somebody else. If not, I'll come back to you. Can anybody think of something for the letter M you want to praise God for? Thank God for. What? Make stuff. Yeah, let her and make stuff because God's a creative God. He made us to be creative. Very good. Okay, so we got, we want to be thankful for puppies, for apples, for life, and that we can make stuff. Okay? So part of our praising God and celebration is also thanking him. Thanking him for who he is, thanking him for what he's done, and thanking him for, for what he's allowed us to enjoy. Okay? So we're going to take a moment, and I'm going to say a quick prayer. We're going to thank God for those things as well as what he did because, you know, the ultimate thing we should be thankful for which is the letter S at the end, for salvation. The most important thing we're thankful for is that he came to save us, to save us from our sins. And that's what this whole week is about, a reminder that Jesus is our deliverer and he saves us from our sins, okay? So let's pray, and I'll put all those together, okay? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful for this week as we remember what you did during this, this Passion Week, as we call it. And God, I pray you help us all to be singing Hosanna, to be praising you. But specifically today, we've got some things we want to thank you for, God. And, and God, we do want to thank you for puppies, God. We love our, our animals and our pets. And, and God, we're, we're thankful for apples, Lord. And, and they're so good and juicy. And we thank you for providing the, the, the treats with us with apples, God. And, and Lord, we thank you for life. We thank you that you gave us life, God, and that we can give life to others, Lord. Father, we thank you for being able to make things that you have given us the ability to be creative. And finally, God, we thank you for S, for your salvation, that you came to save us by dying on the cross for our sins. We're so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. One more time. Everybody say palms. All right. You guys go take a seat. Go sit down. Good job, guys. All right. Well done. Yeah. They did good. Excellent. Good job. Well, obviously today we're going to be talking about Palm Sunday, and that is what we're doing. We're going to turn in your text there, uh, in your Bibles there, uh, we'll be looking at from king to criminal to king is what we'll be talking about today. We're looking at Matthew 21, and I actually want us to go to John chapter 19 in particular. Uh, we'll touch on Palm Sunday here a little bit this morning, but a good portion of our text is going to be out of John. So if you could please turn there in, into book John uh, chapter 19. John 19, we're going to start in verse 1 here. All right, if you please please stand, I'm going to read through John 19. John chapter 19, I'm actually going to start... In verse 16, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to read 16 through, 20, through 30. John 19, starting in 16. So he that is Pilate delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull 
which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. And the inscription read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man claimed I am king of the Jews. But Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word today, and we are reminded, God, we come today as as a way of reminder of what Jesus, of what you did for us, the suffering you went through, how, how you were king and yet you were crucified as a criminal. And Lord, I pray that as we go through this text today that you will just bring it to life once again to us, that you will stir our hearts, God, to gratitude, stir our hearts to praise, Lord, and thanksgiving, and help us to see and understand what you would have us see and understand today. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and for a second, keep your finger there in John 19, and go ahead and flip your Bibles back to Matthew 21. As I said, we will touch on a few things. I covered most everything in my uh, little children's message there, but I want to highlight a couple things here in context of the sermon topic today, Matthew 21 there. Now, as I, mess, as I mentioned to you kids, and I am going to point out again that we're going to look at here the first, from king to criminal, we're looking at Jesus' coming in to Jerusalem at Palm Sunday. And we talk about the crowd's coronation. And, and the coronation means that this celebration of crowning him king, of declaring that he's going to be the king, and that's what we see in this Palm Sunday celebration of them coming in. And as I mentioned to the kids, that whole thing was a, a prophecy that was being fulfilled that Jesus was doing. And so when we look here, we see Zechariah, we see the fulfillment right here. Zechariah 9.9 is where it comes from. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. For behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Here's the key, humble and mounted on a donkey. Remember I said a warrior king might come in on a stallion full of pride and arrogance even. And we see, no, Jesus comes in humble, mounted on a donkey, a beast of burden, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, you have to understand something about the Passover expectations. You know, they celebrated, this is the beginning of the Passover week when we celebrate this. Right? Actually, if you look at the calendar, and, and we were, my wife and I were discussing this the other day, uh, but it's, it's not celebrated. We don't, so they don't, we don't only celebrate the Passover week or the Passion week at the same time the Jews actually celebrate it. And if you actually go on the calendar, you'll see that the actual Passover week is until next month. And yet here, because of the way the calendar lies up and, and what we follow in the calendar, it's, it's earlier. But the Passover is something every year. 
every year the Passover occurred. Every year at the Passover, the men in particular were required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast and offer their sacrifices. It was a requirement of the Jewish people. Every year this happened as a remembrance of God redeeming Israel out of slavery in Egypt and a foreshadowing of God's deliverance. Every year they were thinking about this. Every year they're awaiting. Every year crying out to God, when will you send your deliverer? When is our king coming? When can we cry out, behold, your king is coming? And they would still celebrate it even though nobody was writing in. And all of a sudden, we have Jesus. And all of a sudden, we have him coming on a donkey. And he's already had three, over three, about three and a half years of ministry of doing miracles and teaching and preaching. And he was well known. Whether people liked him or not, everyone knew who he was. And all of a sudden, at Passover, he comes in a donkey, riding in. You can imagine the excitement and the fervor of what they're anticipating, that the prophecy is about to be fulfilled. Behold, your king. And it's a coronation of the crowd. Now, you understand, in general, Passover expectations. There was roughly 2.5 million pilgrims. 2.5 million pilgrims were traveling to Jerusalem at this time. So you can expect that. Just think about if 2.5 million people were, were going to try to descend upon Sioux Falls. Okay? Imagine the type of security that all of a sudden would be needed. And, and we push that back because that's exactly what happened. Security was heightened and, and people were concerned because the Romans knew of this messianic expectation. And so did the Jewish leaders. Because even in their teachings, here's three things they thought of at this time leading up to it. I kind of got ahead of myself and split a little bit, so I'll back up a sec. But here's three things they were thinking. The very first they were thinking, these are the Passover expectations. The very first thing they were thinking is maybe this is the year Elijah comes. So in these expectations of the Passover, maybe this is the year Elijah comes first, because in Malachi 4, 5, it says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Maybe this is the year Elijah comes. Now, what's fascinating about that, if you didn't know that in the Passover celebration of the Seder feast, they would sit down around the table, and they would, be, they would go through the elements of reminding themselves and the back and forth questions of, of God taking them out of Egypt, but they would always leave an empty seat around the table. It was part of the tradition. The reason they left an empty seat around the table was because they were waiting to see that seat was reserved for Elijah. That was a seat they were hoping that someday Elijah would come and join them in the Passover meal as a fulfillment of this. So maybe this is the year Elijah comes. The second Passover expectation then is maybe this is the year that the prophet like Moses comes. You look at what he says in Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. And this, is, again, is a prophecy of Jesus. But maybe this is the year the prophet like Moses comes, and they wouldn't have thought of it necessarily as Jesus, obviously, but they were thinking of the Messiah. And then finally, of course, as I just said, maybe this is the year Messiah comes to save us. And so you look at the questioning here in John, earlier, earlier in John chapter 1. You look at the questioning because this is what's going through their minds. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, to ask John, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny but confessed, I am not the Christ. And so they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? See, there's that Elijah expectation. He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? That's the Moses, the one like him. He says, no. So we see all three of these expectations from the priests coming out here, the Christ or the Messiah, Elijah, and the prophet. And, of course, John says, no. And so the security, again, because of these expectations, it was beefed up because they were afraid of a revolt. They were afraid that when the Messiah actually finally came, then they would get overthrown. The second thing out of this Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna is the word actually when it's in context means victory, as I was saying earlier. It means victorious, to save, to deliver uh, from tribulation, to rescue. And, and the cry is something the effect of give salvation now. And so you think of it as an expectation. Every Passover, when they're crying out, Hosanna, it's God, give salvation now. God, give salvation now. God, give salvation now. Every single year for, for a long, long time. Finally, of course, Jesus comes in, and what we see then, so victorious, and then we see is the king. The king comes in, and we see that stressed in the, in the phraseology of 
Matthew 21 there, where he talks about they're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. For blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The son of David stresses his kingly role that Messiah was to play. Second Samuel, real quick, I'll run through these quickly, but here's the fulfillment. Now, therefore, you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you, David, a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever and your throne shall be established forever. This was a covenant promise of God to David and to all of his descendants. And so going all the way back here to 2 Samuel, we see the foreshadowing of the king, the descendant of David. And here at the triumphal entry, here at this time as Jesus comes in, they're crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. They clearly were expecting and understanding that Jesus walking in, they were claiming, coronating him as that king in the line of of David, prophecy to be fulfilled. And then it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Luke 19, it's interesting, it says, blessed is the king, Luke adds the king in there, who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, which is a little bit of reminiscence from his birth, when the angel appeared to them. And said, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace upon men on whom his favor rests. And we see that little hint here, blessed is the king. We're coronating this king, and he's going to bring peace, and he's going to fulfill the promises to Israel and the promises to people. And then finally, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. So we see the coronation of the crowd. But now we're going to see something that we got the king coming into Jerusalem. Everyone's acknowledging him. The Jews, I should say. Everyone, the Jews, they're acknowledging. Most of the Jews. I can't say all the Jews. But they're acknowledging him as king and coronation. And then we see a total change where he starts to change that because now we see a coronation of the Roman soldiers. We see the Roman soldiers' coronation. Now you're going to flip back over to John 19. Not even a week later. Not even a week later, John 19. He comes in at the height of everything, being praised and worshipped, being announced, being coronated as the king. And now we get to see how the Roman soldiers respond to this once he's arrested. And of course, we'll cover Thursday and Friday and later on this week specifically. I'm pressing ahead a little bit here. John 19, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. The Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Behold the man. This is the Roman soldier's coronation of them. And it's in a mocking trial. And they're putting a crown of thorns and a purple robe on him. And it's fully and totally to mock him for his claims of being king. Now here's the irony though. The irony of the Greek word that John chose in this text is the word Stephanus. And Stephanus is the crown that was given to the victor in the games, in the Greek games. And so subtly John is working in there that even though on the surface area they are mocking him and they're putting together this crown of thorns and they're putting it on his head and they're putting the cloak around them, John says, "Uh uh-huh, trick on them. They think they're mocking him, but the very crown they're putting on him is his crown of victory. His crown of victory. Now I want you to think about this. It was a crown of what? A crown of thorns. What happened in the Garden of Eden? 
Were there thorns before sin? No. No. There were no thorns before sin. The only reason that crown could have been created because of their sin. And so guess what they're doing? They're taking the very effects of the curse and putting it on this crown. And they're sticking it on Jesus' head. Because Jesus says, I'm going to be victorious over the curse. I'm victorious over sin. And the very symbol of the sin of mankind, the very symbol of the curse that came out of that, I wear as a crown of victory because I came to conquer. And I will conquer on the cross. Of course, they mock him. What do they say? Hail, King of the Jews. And they mock instead of praise him. They slap him instead of kissing him as they should have. And then Pilate says to them, behold, the man. This is like Pilate's derogatory mocking. (laughs) Really? You think this is a king? This poor, pathetic, weak, frail, whipped figure, you think he's a king? He's just a mere mortal. He's not the king. In fact, he uses the derogatory term. In his mind, he's thinking, see, this is, behold, the man. He's not God. He's not king of anything. He's just a man. But what's interesting, and this is the subtlety of the backside that they don't know. So, Stephanus, victory crown. Behold, the man. Did you know the son of man was Jesus' favorite term to use about himself? It was a term that he loved because it reminds him as a suffering servant in whom God delights. And even though they were trying to mock him with behold the man, Jesus took that as a badge of honor. Yes, I am God's servant. Yes, I am man, but I am also God. And you may not recognize it, but now I have a crown on my head of my victory, and I am coming as a suffering servant, and you are trying to mock it, but through your mocking, you're actually declaring it. You are actually fulfilling it. You don't even realize that in your sin, you are fulfilling the great plan of God that I can bring salvation and forgiveness to the world. Well, obviously, he didn't stop there. Look at verse 6 and following there, John chapter 19 again. When the chief priests and the officers say, saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law. According to that law, he ought to die because he's made himself out to be the son of God rather than the son of man. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his quarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And I love the statement of Jesus. Jesus says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he was delivered you over to me has done the greater sin. And so from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. For everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. They're still acknowledging this claim. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, and sat him down on the judgment seat of the place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. And now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Now he says, look, behold your king. There was an interesting change here, interesting change. But let's look briefly real quickly at the criminal's condemnation, at the criminal's condemnation, sorry, the criminal's condemnation. They call out first, crucify, crucify, and that was a term to the cross, to the cross, because there's two things we see in this that comes out. The very first thing we see is that the death penalty in the Jews there was for someone claimed to be deity. So they're calling out and saying, hey, he deserves the death penalty because he's claiming to be God. But then they don't go. They don't just stop there. They say the second thing is now he has, needs to have the death penalty for attempting to usurp the Caesar's throne. So now we've got two counts against him that should deserve the death penalty, Judaism and political. And they're crying out, to the cross, this is what he deserves. This is what he deserves for claiming to be a deity and trying to usurp. Caesar, and if we rose from a king who was being coronated in this city, now he's being crucified as a criminal, and then we see now he gets put on that very cross, which was a curse, which was a curse. Deuteronomy 21 makes it very clear. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree. 
but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord God gives you as an inheritance. This is Jesus on the cross, crucified as a curse. This was a curse he was taken, the curse of the cross. And then we see Jesus cry out in Matthew 27, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus hangs bleeding on that cross, hanging there because, remember I said already, he has taken that cross, that, the crown of the curse on his head, and he carries that curse to the cross, and he hangs there as the curse for you and me so that we do not have to be cursed by God. Jesus takes our curse, and he suffers as a criminal's punishment. He suffers the curse of the criminal. The cross was such a heinous penalty. Did you know this? The cross was such a heinous penalty that it was not given to Roman citizens. If you were a Roman citizen, you, were, you could not be hanged on the cross. It was only reserved for the most vile of practices and for those that were not Roman citizens. And then we have this very interesting thing. On the cross then, as he's bearing the curse and the sin of humanity, we hear the cry of the cursed, the cry of the cursed. And the very first, the cry he cries out here is, I thirst, I thirst. And this cry of his heart, and John says it's a fulfillment of Scripture. There's a lot of debate on the scholars over what passage that he was referencing when he says, I thirst. I tend to think it goes to Psalm 42 too. And if you read the whole thing, I think you'll see why. But here's the part where he says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? His soul is thirsting because there has been a separation. You go and read Psalm 42 and it talks about he remembers how wonderful it was to worship God in the sanctuary. And here now he is experiencing a separation from God. And the rest of that psalm says, why are you so downcast, O oh, my soul? Put your hope in God. And the psalmist here is crying out of his separation. And we see Jesus on the cross crying out, ah, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why am I separated from you? And I thirst, I thirst, I long for that fellowship and the communion. But I have to go through what I'm going through. I have to be separated from you. I have to bear the curse of mankind. I have to take on your wrath. Because if I don't, that gets put out upon your people. And Jesus willingly hangs on the cross. So we don't have to endure the wrath of God. Starts out as king, coronated by the crowd. He comes down and gets mocked as a king. He comes down further and as a curse, as a criminal, gets hung on the cross. And then as I stop, we start to see an interesting little turn here. Because what we see next is we see Pilate's coronation. And as I already showed you in the beginning, he said, behold the man. And then through his exchange with Jesus, something starts to change within Pilate. And now he comes out there, as I just read, and he says, hey, behold your king. That's verse 14. And of course, they cry out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. King, mocked as a king, crucified as a criminal. And all of a sudden, Pilate goes, whoa, there's more going on here. He is a king. He really is the king. Behold, your king. He hung Jesus. Now, you may not know this, but remember, well, you remember how many, how many other crosses were there as, we, as far as we know? Three. There were two other crosses, three total. We had one on his right and one on his left. A lot of times what they would do is when they were going to crucify, they would catch, if they catch a gang, well, we'll use the word gang. Okay, we had, they caught the gang. They caught the ringleader of the gang. And maybe they caught a couple other people from his gang. The ringleader or leader of the gang would always get hung in the middle. The middle cross was the privileged position, the position for the leader of the gang to be hung, and then his cohorts would be on the right and the left, and his accomplices would hang there. But here's what's interesting. Jesus hanging in the middle, I want you to think about this, he's in the middle between two other crosses. Jesus stands in the middle as mediator 
between God and man. And he's in the middle, and in some ways he's mediating because if you think about it, and I don't remember right or left, it's probably in the text, but one thief towards the end repented, right? One thief towards the end turned and said, remember me when you get in the kingdom. The other thief said what? The other thief mocked him and said, hey, he's just suffering justly like we are. And he's looking at them. We got a believer. We have an unbeliever. We have Jesus in the middle mitigating, mediating. But you know what? That's no different than any of us. Actually, if you think about it, we're hanging on those crosses next to Jesus. And the choice is pretty clear. You have two choices to make. Jesus is hanging in the middle. He is bearing your sins on the cross so that you don't have to take the punishment from God. And the question is, which thief are you? Are you the thief on one side who says, I repent, I deserve my sins, but I'm turning to you, Jesus, and forgive me? Or are you going to be the thief that continues to live in your sin and reject the Savior? And that's part of the message that comes out. Because at that point, everything turns. Because as he comes out of that as king, he begins to now conquer. Because on the cross, he conquers sin, and he becomes the Savior. A total side note on that. That was the wrong time. Okay. The inscriptions on the cross. Normally, the crimes of the condemned were placed on the placard and nailed above their head. It's when it said, King of the Jews. That was his crime. That was his sin. And remember, they didn't want it to say King of the Jews, but he claimed to be King of the Jews. But Pilate's like, nope, it is what it is. But normally the crimes were carried there. And it was symbolic, though. It was symbolic of Jesus as king bearing all our sins. All our sins are nailed to that. Because the final cry of the king, the cry of the cursed was, I thirst. But the cry of the king is, it is finished. It is finished. Because the curse has been taken away. Galatians 3, and look what it says here in Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs in a tree. It's the scripture we saw in Deuteronomy. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus hung there. We are blessed because of it. And I love this because you know... <laughs> In the original language, what it is finished means? In the original language, it is finished means paid in full. That's what it is finished means. When Jesus got up there and when he cried out from that cross, it is finished. He was saying paid in full. Because his blood shed on the cross. Your sins are paid in full. There is no more debt for you if you will just put your faith in Jesus Christ. Paid in full. The power and authority of Satan is broken. One more quick scripture here. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way. What does it say? Having what? Nailed it to the cross. Again, that placard above his head that claimed all the sins. A lot of times when they walked down towards Golgotha, they would hang that placard around their neck. Not only they haul on their own cross, but on the placard around their neck would be the list of the sins. And they would take that placard and put it up above their heads. What Paul is telling us here is that in that situation there, spiritually speaking, it was our sins that were on that placard that hung around Jesus' neck that were now placed above his head. All of that, that was hostile to us, was nailed to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And look at what happens as a result. Number one, as we get ready to wrap up, I want you to ponder these three things in particular. Number one, it talks about being made alive together with him. And being alive means death canceled. You are brought from death to life. Death no longer has power over us, which was Satan's goal. Satan's goal, demolished. The second thing we see in that is having forgiven us of our transgressions in that text in Colossians. Forgiven, debts, canceled. 
Sin no longer has power over us. Our crimes are written on this placard, and these are Satan's accusations. Satan's accusations against us, broken. Satan's goal, demolish Satan's accusations, broken. The final piece of Colossians 2 is faith. The written code was canceled. Favor with God is no longer based on works. The law no longer has power over us. And the law was Satan's weapon for a long time, legalism. Satan's goal demolished, Satan's, Satan's accusations broken, and Satan's weapon destroyed. Because you put your faith on Jesus, you are alive, you are forgiven by your faith. And the final points there, last of all, is the reign of the king. The reign of the king. The first thing it says in Scripture, Hebrews 1.3 touches on that. It says right there, he sat down. Anytime a king and a warrior came in and they were finished, they would sit down. Them sitting down was a sign of the final victory. Hebrews 1.3, and he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And that's when we see the final piece of his swing back up to king. So we had the coronation as king by the crowd, the dip down as criminal to being cursed on the cross, Pilate's beginning his declaration that he is king, and then because of what he went through, he's back as king sitting on the throne. From king to criminal to king. And then as king, he rules. Scripture says he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished will be death. And then as king, not only did he sat down and he rules finally, but there's a final judgment that's coming. The final judgment that's coming. And I'm going to share a little bit more about this at the communion, at our uh, soup supper on Thursday. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's called the fifth cup. The fifth cup at the Passover. The Passover Seder had five cups. The fourth cup was the cup of redemption. That's the cup we drink from when we take communion. But the fifth cup is called the cup of Elijah. And we'll talk about the cup of Elijah at our communion on Thursday. And then finally, the last piece of this is the final eternal reign of Christ. The final eternal reign of Christ. Revelation 21, 5 and 6. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, Look at that phrase. What does it say? It is done. It's reminiscent of it is finished on the cross. It is a different phrase, but it's reminiscent of that. He says it is finished on the cross, and at this point he says, guys, it's done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give to the one who thirsts, remember the I thirst, and the spring of the water of life without cost. And God brings all this back full circle. Jesus is reigning in heaven, and he calls us to faith in his sacrifice. We too will be in heaven someday with him. So the application for you guys today is simply this. Number one, if you haven't done so, put your faith in the King Jesus. Number two, if you have put your faith in Jesus, be thankful for what he's done for you, like we talked about these kids. Hosanna, praise him in song. And then just like Jesus sacrificed himself, serve him with your life as a sacrifice. And finally, and this is a key that I didn't get to touch on as much today for lack of time, but I'll highlight a little more on Thursday. Be patient. Be patient. God will bring about justice upon the wicked. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that piece a lot more Thursday night. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for what you've done for us. To know that you were king. You were king in heaven even before the crowd coronated you here on Palm Sunday. You were king. And you came down. You were still called king at the coronation. And yet then, because of your plan, he was crucified as a criminal. But we're so thankful that that's not the end of the story. We're so thankful that you rose again, and you're now seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, thank you for going through what you went through, that we could be saved and have eternal life. And I pray, Father, if there is anybody in this room that has not given their life to you, they have not made you the king of their life and put their faith in your sacrifice, Jesus. I pray they would do so today. For all of us who have done that, 
We just want to offer thanksgiving and praise to you for what you have done for us. And as we continue to reflect on that sacrifice this rest of this week, just fill our hearts, God, with a new sense of awe at who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we close with the song. We'll talk about praising God and being thankful for what he's done. I love the song, This is Amazing Grace. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. Set free, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. And this is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Jesus I 
Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me yeah yeah all that you've done for done for me. Jesus, we do thank you for all that you've done for us. And you pray, God, that you continue to help us to be reminded of that, to be thankful for all you've done. Go with God. May his grace surround you and cover you today. Be filled with joy over his sacrifice for you. In Jesus' name, amen. See you guys later this week. All right, Chad, can I unplug? Thank you for another great day on planet Earth. Amen. I heard the preacher talking about three wooden crosses upon a hill for everyone to see. Two sinners on the outside couldn't save themselves if they tried All I could think is, man, that sounds like me I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my cost, thank God for the man on the middle cross